Um, so thank you so much. Thank you, Hal, for the kind words. Thank you, Cliff and David, for inviting us and hosting us and organizing this. Um, thank you all for coming and spending your afternoon. Um, we are honored and excited to be part of this conversation and, and look forward to your comments and your feedback. Um, this book, at some level, is a summary of some of the research agenda that Michael and I have pursued over the last 10, 15 years. And in all honesty, some of that research was also supported and funded by Google. So thank you all around. Um, appreciate it very much. So um, we decided that maybe we'll talk for about 30, 35 minutes and then open uh, the floor for some discussion and some questions. So I'll take the first half. Michael will speak in the second half. And then he also agreed that any difficult questions, he'll be more than happy to tackle. Um, OK. So let me start with let me start with a story uh, that we also have in the book. Uh, many of you might have read this book, would have seen the movie *The Perfect Storm*. And the idea behind uh, the, the book was there were this um, I think six seamen who were trying to get to the land as quickly as possible because they had a valuable catch. Uh, the only trouble was to get to the route that was the quickest to the land also had turbulent weather and potential storms. But uh, the crew thought that they have experience dealing with such storms and they would be able to survive this. So they decided to take, uh, take that particular route. Uh, but, but, they, but they underestimated the risk. Um, and what happens is they ran into not just one storm, but confluence of storms. That's why the title, The Perfect Storms. And unfortunately, they perished. What we believe that in the entertainment industry, similar technological turbulence and disruptions are taking place. And unless and until the traditional firms are able to adapt and change their business model, they are going to be at a significant competitive disadvantage. And when I say entertainment industry, predominantly we discuss the publishing industry, the, the music industry, the television, and the motion picture industry. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what are some of the major technological changes that are taking place. Um, but before I go there, I wanted to spend a little bit of time going back in history and arguing that this industry pretty much has been dominated by a very few set of players. If you look at the history of 100 years, whether it's publishing, whether it's motion picture, whether it's uh, music industry, a few firms have essentially dominated this industry for a, for a long period of time, and, and sometimes the very same firms that have dominated. And you, know, you wonder, what is it about the industry or what is it about the firms that gives them that advantage to continue to acquire and have a large market share? So one of the most important assets you needed to have if you were in this industry, if you were one of these firms, was that you, need, you needed scale and size. And why did you need scale and size? For the simple reason that one of the core functions many of these firms performed was to basically find the talent, um, hopefully predict that some of the talent is going to be turn into stars or superstars, so whether you are a music label or whether you are a publisher, you're trying to find that author or you're find, trying to find that artist who is going to become successful. Unfortunately, to be able to make that prediction, to be able to figure out who is going to be that next star um, was unscientific at best. There was very little data. There was very little analysis that one could do to figure out. You know, you could, you could you know, have some information, but broadly, it was difficult to say who is going to be successful and who is going to fail. And, and most of the artists, or most of the authors, or most of the scripts probably turn out to be not all that much successful. In fact, a very few, a handful of the projects actually became very successful. So naturally, you know, the one business principle was to follow the gut feel or follow your superior, superior instincts to kind of identify the potential talent and then get it to the, to the mass audience. There was a very nice quote, actually, by William Goldman, who said that nobody knows anything. In the, in the motion picture industry, uh, everything was basically a guess. And if you're lucky, that's an educated guess. 
So that was how more or less uh, you know, some, of the, some of the way the processes in the industry work. The, so, and beyond then finding the talent, the second job that the firm needed to do was to get it in front of the audience, basically convince the audience and the mass market that you actually have a superstar uh, you know, waiting. So now you have majority of the projects likely to fail, so you needed scale and size to support a slew of projects, so a few of them turn out to be very successful. And then you needed power to be able to very aggressively campaign for that star, for that artist, for that movie. So you needed to influence, say, a radio station to play your artist song so that people can listen to that. Or in a physical store where there was a limited shelf space, you needed power to be able to convince that retailer to stock your item and prominently display it and so on and so forth so that people can know about it. Again, the firm who had the scale and the size and the stable of successful stars were able to do it. If you were a small independent firm, it was tough to compete against that model on both sides where you needed scale and size. So naturally, if you are a budding artist or an author or a script writer, you probably felt that going with the big firms was a ticket to success because they had these you know, natural advantages. The third thing they also did, and they had going for them, was that they could control their content where they could, what we call usually is that apply some of the product discrimination strategy. So what they could do was sell the same or similar product at different time to different people in different channels. Um, and be able to monetize the product over its lifetime. So for example, if you are in a motion picture industry, the movie will release in a theater, then it'll go in the DVD, then it'll go into the pay-per-view, they'll go into the HBO window over there, so on and so forth. And all of these formats allowed you to both expand your market, so more and more people can watch uh, and sometimes, actually, it allowed you to sell the similar product multiple times to the same user. So you watch the movie in theater, you also got the DVD, and you might have watched the movie back, in, um, back in, um, on the TV. So once you have all of these three going, which is you, you could control the supply of talent, you could control the distribution, and you could control um, how, the, how the content was flowing through various channels, you had a very successful and a robust business model. And this particular model worked for a very long time. In fact, it worked so well that most of these firms were highly successful and profitable. And you know, one, of, one of the senior executives actually came to one of our classes, and you know, he was very confident, saying, look, we have been successful for the last 100 years. We know how to create the content. And there is no reason why we, we will not continue to be successful in the foreseeable future as well. Look at our business model. So what are the technology disruption we believe have been taking place over the last 10, 15 years that we believe are eroding some of these advantages that the firm has? Um, the first is the internet and broadband. It might seem trivial, but the internet and broadband had this enormous impact. Some of, it, some of that impact came through that the internet basically spawned enormous amount of online piracy and infringement of content. In fact, if you go back and look at the music industry, you, know, you could literally uh, split the music industry in two, two periods, before Napster and after Napster. That's the kind of impact the Napsters of this world had on the industry. So you know, going beyond the fact that piracy had a very large negative effect on the firm's ability to monetize, uh, it actually had a large effect on their windowing strategy and how they release the product. Now it was very hard to wait and release the product in an international market a month later because piracy ate into that revenue. It became harder for you to delay the product in one channel versus the other channel because, again, people found it easier to then go and essentially infringe. So your ability to monetize the life cycle of the project uh, of the product, which was a very valuable source of revenues for some of these quote unquote catalog titles, uh, became much more challenging when, when, the, when the internet and broadband came about uh, and, and, and started cutting into your ability to control the, control the content. 
This is a very quick example I'll give. This was an example of how this control got eroded a little bit. This was a dispute NBC had with Apple iTunes. And they decided, NBC decided that they were going to take all the content away from, from iTunes. And, and in the hope that maybe they will be able to exert some power on Apple to, to sign more favorable deal. Um, basically, what happened is as soon as NBC took the content away from Apple, people started flocking to BitTorrent Network and started downloading what was available legally now into, uh, uh, from, the, from the piracy network. Again, suggesting that your ability to then negotiate with different channels got severely eroded because the piracy came about and, and people found it much easier than to, to get the content from sources uh, if you didn't make, make it available on the legal channel. The second thing that happened was then the digitization meant that there was a you know, revolution where the cost of producing content fell very significantly. So now you can write a book, you can uh, you know, record a music, or even shoot a movie at a fraction of cost than what was possible earlier. And then you had this bunch of uh, platforms like the YouTubes and, and uh, Facebook and, and what have you that made it much cheaper for people to actually get their product and get their content in front of the mass audience. So at some level, the big companies, the, the major players in the industry did two things, right? They identified the talent and they got the talent to the mass market. And now you had the technological changes happening which made the role of a gatekeeper for these firms, again, got eroded because many people started bypassing them and said, we can directly go. It doesn't happen all the time, but for many artists, it's much easier to do. That again meant that their ability to negotiate with artists and authors and script writers and, and what have you uh, was, was again eroded because, because of these uh, digitization. So we give many examples in the book. Here are all of different players who actually bypassed to an extent the traditional players, and on their own right, actually became very successful. So Amanda Hawking became a very popular author, just doing self-publishing. Lindsey Sterling, who is a hip-hop violinist and you know musician, you know, the music label thought that she doesn't fit into any traditional categorization. She became a YouTube sensation. You know, Fifty Shades of Grey, probably all of you know, it's a blockbuster, but actually it was a very obscure book. It was a self-published published book and totally relied on viral marketing to get its name out. And obviously, now it's a multi-million dollar product. Or Nilesh Mishra, who runs a radio show in India, which is completely crowdsourced. So he sources all these movies. People submit the stories. Everything gets uh, outsourced and crowdsourced. And it's, he runs a very, very popular show. In all of these examples, what you see is that the middlemen or the gatekeepers or their ability to exercise power got eroded a little bit. And finally, what we had was the growth of these online platforms, the Amazons, the Netflix, the YouTubes, and the Googles of this world. They did not have limited shelf space. So Amazon could stock hundreds and thousands of uh, books uh, or movies or, or music titles. Um, and, the, and they also realized that to be able to satisfy their customer, they needed to use the information they're collecting from their consumers to offer appropriate and correct recommendation to delight its consumers. So it started using enormous amount of data to make that appropriate recommendations. So, so on one hand, we had the major players who did content curation. So they decided which content was going to go in front of public and control the content. And the, on the other hand, we had these online platform that said, I'm not going to do content curation. Every content is available on my platform. But I will make it easy. I will make it easy for consumers to find what they actually like. So I'll offer them what I believe that the consumer might be interested in. So again, some of the power started shifting toward these online players. Obviously, I don't have to convince you that the Amazons and Netflix are you know, their scale and size is also much bigger. Netflix operates in 80 different countries. Amazon has a very large footprint. So now they have this enormous power in deciding how to price the product, how to promote the product, how to recommend the product to the, to the end user. 
again means that they have a lot more negotiating power when they're you know, getting the content from uh, the content creators, uh, whether it's music or movies and so, so on and so forth. Now, all of this still would have been fine, except that some of these companies then decided that they actually want to now go into the content production. So the Netflix of the world then decided that, look, I have deep pockets. Um, we have this enormous amount of customer data and a very large customer base. Why not I can hire the talent which can create the content, and I will become verti vertically integrated company from creating the content to distributing uh, and promoting and advertising the content to my consumer base. And, and this is one of the biggest important and a competitive threat to the existing players. And now I, you know, Michael is going to talk about the way Netflix goes about creating the content is very different than what the traditional players have generally created the content. And one more element being that all of, all of these companies, they basically make decisions based on data rather than on gut feel or on instincts. They have a large consumer base. They have enormous amount of data about what consumer does, what consumer doesn't do, what are their preferences. They hire the people who have the skills to actually use that data. And based on that combination, now they are going in the market and say, I can actually do better than some of these traditional firms potentially can do. I have the financial wherewithal. I have this enormous consumer base that's loyal to me. And this is really, at some level, we are talking about the perfect storm that the traditional players are facing. So Michael is going to probably talk about how they're using it. Thanks, Rahul. Um, so I would argue if this were a traditional industry, we could stop right here right, and go directly to what they should do. I think there's, there's a strong argument you can make that technology is changing the source of power in this industry. Let's talk about what the industry should do. Um, I would argue that entertainment is not a typical industry in the sense that they're very interested in the second question. Will technological change actually damage my ability to make great content? And, and you might disagree with me about this, but, but I think this question in many ways is every bit as important to, to the traditional industry as the first question is. Um, I think if you were to say, here's a technology that's going to allow you to make more money, but it's going to significantly damage the quality of storytelling, they'd probably say, hey, you know what, we'll just stick with what we've, what we've got. All right. Um, so so let, me tell, let me tell a story uh, uh, about why this might damage the quality of, of storytelling. Uh, a few years ago, I was sitting with Monty, uh, and we were getting ready to watch House of Cards on, on Netflix. Um, we were on our favorite couch. I turned off the lights, and, and we start the show. Um, if you've seen the first episode of House of Cards, you know it starts with a black screen, and then the sound of screeching tires, and then a collision, and then a whimpering dog. Right? And, it, and at this point, Kevin Spacey's character, uh, Senator Frank Underwood, comes out of his house and approaches the scene of the accident. Um, now, Monty was, was clearly nervous at this point. He was huddled up all the way at the other end of the couch and, and looking very uncomfortable. But I figured everything's going to be OK, right? As the, as the lead character, Frank Underwood's going to do what lead characters always do when you introduce them to the audience. He's going to perform some noble act to endear himself to us, like saving or protecting the injured dog, right? So Frank Underwood does something completely unexpected. He, he approaches the dog. And then he speaks directly to the camera, and he leans down and strangles the animal. Okay? So, so this was too much. I had to turn off the, the show. I had to turn back on the lights so I wouldn't severely scar my, my, friend, my friend Monty. Um, now, why might this be bad for entertainment? Right? After all, ever since we've had televisions, people have been turning them off for all sorts of reasons. The reason this might be bad for entertainment is that now Netflix knows exactly when Monty and I turned off the show. And the fear is they might combine that with information about when millions of other viewers turned off their shows and use that to start to use data and algorithms to make creative decisions. OK? Makes, makes sense? Um, so so that's, that's the concern. 
Um, and that's, that's the real motivation for what, why we wanted to include the answer to this question in, in the book, is a lot of people are worried that technological change is going to damage the quality of entertainment. Um, while we were writing the book, we learned, learned an awful lot about this, about, you know, about this question and, and an awful lot about the industry. The first thing we learned is that writing a book is really hard. Uh, you see, this was, this was our first book. As academics, we feel pretty comfortable writing 30-page papers. Um, so when we sat down with our editor at MIT Press and she said, you know, the book ought to be 200, maybe 250 pages long, Rahul and I looked at each other, we did the math, and we said, huh, sounds like if we write seven 30-page papers, we ought to be done. How hard could that be? Um, and the answer is, you're an idiot. Writing a book is nothing like writing seven different papers. The reason it's different is that your publisher expects you to tell a story. And storytelling is just incredibly hard. And I think the painful realization of just how difficult storytelling is gave me and Rahul a, a much deeper appreciation for the many talented storytellers in the publishing music and movie businesses and for how much we all benefit from the work they do. But I think also a renewed passion for understanding whether technology might be damaging their ability to bring great stories to the audience. Okay? And many of our friends in the industry are worried that it will. Um, and not just because using data and algorithms to make creative decisions could be bad for the quality of, of content. They're also worried that the platforms, the new data-driven platforms, are just making too much content in the first place. So in recent years, we've seen an explosion in new creative output much of it coming from Silicon Valley, not Hollywood. Uh, think Orange is the New Black, Transparent, or my new favorite, uh, Stranger Things. And, and things in this industry, I would argue, just keep getting stranger. You know, in, in the past year, Netflix announced that it was tripling its output of original programming. Amazon announced that they were going to start to produce 12 movies per year for their, for their platform. And, and this little company called uh, Google uh, announced uh, YouTube Red with plans for 10 original movies of, of their own. Carlton Cuse, the Emmy Award winning showrunner, argued that this is going to be bad for the quality of entertainment. And he used a sports analogy. What he said is, this explosion in new output is very similar to what would happen if the NFL suddenly expanded to have 90 teams. You have a whole bunch more football available to you, but the quality of it would be significantly diluted. Right? But if data is going to ruin the quality of entertainment, then why are the new data-driven platforms winning so many awards? Netflix has, has taken home 133 Emmy nominations, including 54 this year alone. And this past December, Netflix and Amazon had more Golden Globe nominations than the combined number of nominations for the top four broadcast networks. And it's not just critics who are happy with what's going on in Silicon Valley. Kevin Spacey himself called, called his experience making House of Cards the most fun and most creatively rewarding experience I've ever had in front of a camera. So creativity, it would seem, is actually thriving in the hands of these new data-driven providers. And to understand why, let's take the advice of Senator Frank Underwood and take a step back. Look at the bigger picture. Okay? That, that's the best Kevin Spacey. I, and anyway. Um, Right. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Don't quit your day job. Um, all right. So let's let's start with the concern that data-driven companies are going to start using data to make creative decisions. Right. This concern is perfectly reasonable given how the industry has always worked. Prior to Netflix, greenlighting decisions were made by a room full of industry veterans. And these experts sat down and used their years of experience to estimate how many people were likely to watch a show. And then they used their beliefs about customer behavior to give the creators notes about which scenes should be cut so as to ensure they retained the audience and made the best use of the scarce broadcast slots. Right? Given how prevalent this is in the industry, it's perfectly reasonable to assume that Netflix and Amazon and Google would use their data to replicate these processes, right? basing greenlighting decisions on actual audience statistics, and then telling creators which scenes to cut based on actual audience behavior instead of notes about how audiences were likely to respond. 
But taking a step back, it's clear that Netflix and Amazon and, and you guys aren't using data to make creative decisions. Um, let's consider the green lighting process for a second, right? Again, prior to Netflix, people used, people used data, pe people used industry ex expertise to make these decisions. And a lot of people in the industry have concluded that Netflix was able to see the potential for House of Cards before anyone else in the industry, because Netflix was able to look into its data and discover that there were a lot of fans of Kevin Spacey's acting, a lot of fans of David Fincher's directing, and a lot of fans of the BBC's House of Cards. And that's what gave them a competitive advantage. But if you think about it for a second, that can't possibly what gave, gave them a competitive advantage, because everybody in the industry already knew that Kevin Spacey and David Fincher were huge, were huge uh, 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 hits, and that the BBC's House of Cards had been a huge success. The advantage Netflix got was from using its data to do something that no traditional broadcast network could replicate. Netflix's advantage didn't come from knowing how many fans of Kevin Spacey were in the audience. Netflix's advantage came from knowing exactly who they were as individuals and their ability to promote content to them directly based on their individual preferences. Okay? Netflix Advantage also changed how content was made. So let's go back to the first scene of House of Cards I talked about a second ago. At the 2014 Aspen Ideas Festival, head writer Bo Williman said that this scene was very controversial among many of the TV veterans on his creative team. They said, you can't kill a dog. You're going to lose half your viewership in the first 30 seconds. Right? So apparently Williman went to, went to David Fincher and said, you know, hey man, are you worried that we're going to lose half our audience if we include this scene? And Fincher said, I don't give a shit. Right? And Williman said he didn't either, so they, so they left the scene in. Um, that level of creative freedom would have been almost unthinkable in traditional broadcast television. On the same Aspen Ideas panel, Disney veteran Michael Eisner said that if he had tried to include a similarly violent scene in an episode of broadcast television, the head of the network would call me, the chairman of the board would call me, I would be out in 10 minutes. So the question is, why did this scene work for Netflix but not for broadcast television? The first answer and the easy one is that Netflix wasn't pursuing an advertising supported business model. So it didn't have to worry about offending advertisers by including a potentially controversial scene. I think the more profound answer, though, is that Netflix didn't face the same scarcity that traditional broadcast networks do. In a traditional broadcast network, you can only deliver one show at a time, so that show has to appeal to as many viewers as possible. But a Netflix subscriber who was offended by Kevin Spacey's actions could choose from thousands of other shows on, on Netflix. And in fact, by watching how people responded, you could actually gain important information about their preferences. Monty and I don't like it when dogs are strangled, and apparently Anthony does. And, and that's OK. I'm not judging. Freak. <laughs> All right? And so this, this brings us back to the other concern about data-driven programming, that too much content is actually going to be bad for the creative quality of the content. Um, again, this is a perfectly reasonable concern given how the business has always worked. The business has always worked sort of like football in the sense that because the broadcast slots were limited, the show with the most viewers was the winner, and everybody who subscribes to Nielsen's rating knows the score the next morning. What we're trying to argue in the book is that Netflix and Amazon and Google are playing by a completely different set of rules. To win, Netflix doesn't have to find more viewers to watch the programs, they, to watch their individual programs. Netflix wins by finding more programs that appeal to the unique interests and preferences of their individual viewers. And that, that, changes, that changes everything about how you measure quality, we argue. Okay? So in the end, we argue Frank Underwood was right. Power is a lot like real estate. The closer you are to the source, the higher your property values. The problem for our friends in Hollywood is that technology has actually shifted the source of power in their industry and reduced the value of many of their existing properties. As Rahul said, for the last 100 years, the source of value in this industry revolved around being able to control how content was created and how content was, was distributed. 
and the scarce resources associated with how consumers got access to the content. Right? What we're trying to argue in the book is that in a data-driven world, none of these assets are as scarce as they once were. The new scarce resource is customer attention. And the new source of power in this industry is the ability to understand detailed information about my preferences and then also to control the platform that allows you to both collect that data and deliver content to me based on my unique preferences. Make sense? All right. So our conclusion to the question of, is big data hurting the quality of entertainment, is actually quite the opposite. Big data is enhancing, in many ways, the quality of entertainment because it gives creators a much broader palette. This brings us to the last point, right? So, so what does this mean to, to us as, as an audience? Um, I think what this means is that big data is actually going to allow us to have content that's going to appeal to exactly your unique needs based on your behavior, no matter who you are. Okay. Now, what does this mean for our friends in the entertainment industry? And here, it's sort of in the spirit of talking about how we, how we made this book, I'll say the hardest part of writing this book wasn't the storytelling, as hard as that was. The hardest part of writing this book was actually saying something that we knew was going to be deeply offensive to many of our friends in the, in, in the entertainment industry. Uh, no one likes to hear that their business might be in trouble or that the strategies they've used for the last 100 years might need to change. Um, at the same time, Rahul and I, you know, sort of at several points, and, and using almost exactly these words, at several points while writing the book, Rahul and I would come into each other's offices and say, are you sure we really want to say this? Like, wouldn't it be easier just to keep our mouths shut, mind our own business, and keep focusing on the research that, that we love doing? Ultimately, just, we decided that wasn't right for a variety of reasons. Number one, as academics, we're trained to follow wherever the data leads. And in this case, I think the data leads to a point of inflection in the history of the entertainment industry. Second, we're fundamentally committed to the idea that our friends in the industry deserve to know the truth. Um, and so we wanted to tell them that. But I think third, and maybe most profoundly, we see this as actually good news for people who love great entertainment. Do you want to enable storytellers to tell great, unique stories? On-demand platforms give you an opportunity to tell stories that just wouldn't be possible in any traditional broadcast network. Do you want to help artists find exactly the right audience for their content? Big data gives you an opportunity to do that with both a precision and a profitability that wouldn't have been possible in any of your existing channels. And, and we're really optimistic that about both the future of the industry and also the future of our friends in, in Hollywood to, to respond to this. Okay? So that's the answer to the first two questions. There's a third question we talk about in the book, and that is what can industry leaders do to respond? Rahul and I decided not to answer that question in this talk in the hopes that people would have some reason to go out and, and actually, actually <laughs> buy the book. Um, okay? So with that, I think we can turn it over to, to, to questions. Is that what you'd like to do next, sir? I think you should take careful note of Hollywood's response by increasing the diversity of their movies. It used to be it was just one Marvel comic book after another, <laughs> but now they've added DC comic books. <laughs> <laughs> no comment. <laughs> All right. Uh, so when we look at uh, uh, streaming of music, we see uh, multiple platforms and Loosely speaking, the tendency is that the platforms have pretty much everything, right? Mm -hmm. You can find everything on Spotify, you can find everything on YouTube Red, you can find everything on Apple Music, it's, everything is there. When you look at movies, uh, you see a bunch of platforms and you can find pretty much nothing on each of them. Okay, I'm exaggerating, but uh, you know, there's a limited, very limited set of movies on Netflix. There's a very limited set of musics on each uh, platform. Mm -hmm. uh, so why do we see the difference uh, between music where you get everything at the same place and there are multiple places like that and movies where this is very much not the case, 
And uh, what, what does the future have in store, if you can speculate? Does this count as a hard question or an easy question? <laughs> Let me start, and then you can, you can, okay. you can come to so. <laughs> So I think the music definitely has gone what we call the subscri subscription-based model. So industry, actually, if you talk to them, they're reasonably excited that if you're willing to pay $9.99 a month in a year that turns out to be about $120, if they can get $120 from a consumer to listen to unlimited music, they will be reasonably happy. Of course, the trouble is to convert people into paying $9.99 a month, which is really the struggle with the Spotify's and the Apple Music and everything else. So that's so the so the music labels and then are willing to work with the platforms and say, okay, I can make my whole catalog available. I think for the motion picture industry, they still have a lot of windowing strategies that go on. That is, they make a ton of money selling DVDs, selling on iTunes, getting the, the television um, uh, audience as well as in, 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 in theaters. If they make this content available on the Netflix of the world, um, I think they are not sure how they are going to monetize. They are not sure whether they want to move in the business world where everything is going to turn into movie from day one, basically become a subscri subscription-based model. Uh, so I, I think for the motion picture industry, I think uh, it's, it's not, it's not going to happen anytime, anytime soon, I believe. So a, a guess without data. Um, let's imagine a world where the heterogeneity in valuations for music, for movies, excuse me, was higher than it is for, for music. Um, in that world, and now, now I'm going back to a famous book, um, Information Something, I can't remember what it was called. <laughs> Information Shared. <laughs> right, where you say bundling's optimal as long as the, as the variance of adding a good to the bundle doesn't, doesn't increase the variance. I could imagine a world where there's enough heterogeneity in movies that for a lot of these movies, adding, an addition, adding the movie to the bundle might increase its, its variance. That's, that's one, one potential exp explanation. I just want to add something to this. The, yeah. uh, the characteristic, we have the author of the book here. Yeah, the characteristic that's, uh, that's interesting is music you want to hear over and over again. Yeah. I love that Nora Jones album. I want to hear it night and day for the next uh, month. Movies you want to see on an occasional basis, with one exception, and that is kids' movies, where they, it's just like music. They want to see it over and over again. And so when you look at the actual evolution of mm. the... Of the uh, the uh, way DVDs worked or the way videotapes worked, it was really the kids' movies that spawned the ownership desire because people wanted to see it over and over again, just like, just like movie, uh, movies. Sorry, just like music. Uh, whereas other, movie, other movies tend to have this one time is enough or two times is enough, something of that sort. Now, I don't know how that plays into the ultimate economic structure of the industry, but it's a very different characteristic of the media. Yeah, and I think that has something to do with the answer to your puzzle. Well, I, I think along those lines, there's actually films that are made for the mass audience versus the ones that are more like a literature thing, and you want to go back to it to enrich your experience of it again and discover new things. But I, I think as far as what you're saying on the uh, the quality of the entertainment, I think for every House of Cards, you also have a Full House, you have a Marco Polo, you have uh, you have a, quite a few. Things that are Is positive tossable. examples or negative examples. I, th I think they're quite negative, actually. <laughs> they're, 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 um, and and it, a lot of it, you you have data. You say that the people like these different plot points. They like these different elements that's incorporated into a story. You've had this since the Roger Corman days. You, you want your prison film with the girl fight with the guns and everything, and let's go make it. You make whatever Speak you want for yourself, to. Speak yourself. Yeah, sure. Um, you you have that. Uh, even there's a book uh, from a couple of years ago that was talking about scripts for big budget films. The Dark Knight and the um, the last the second Star Trek movie were made from the same thing. One had a good execution, one not so good. People didn't respond to it. They do the same plot points at the same beats in the movie. If you if you time them, they're roughly a bad guy gets captured, bad guy gets let go. You know, they're they're doing these things at the exact same times, except one does it well, one doesn't do it so well. So there yeah. is artistry to allow for with no, the no, data no, points. No, no, no. And and again, I'm, we're not claiming that the artistry goes away. I think all we're claiming is that you can, you can do things profitably in an on-demand platform that wouldn't be profitable in, in, in a la carte sales. But go, but go ahead. Sure. And, and, but along those lines, do you, are you also considering the fact that for the, the television environment, the, the theater environment, you have to allot time for the next showing, the next, uh, the, the, the commercials, the trailers, 
online, you don't have to do that. So it's also allowing for a longer time to tell a story can make those better stories even more better. But the garbage shows, they kind of just stick around a little bit longer. Again, I, I would go back to the notion that you're absolutely right. In a world where I don't have commercials, in a world where I don't have to wait a week to see the next episode, I can do stuff. I can make stuff work that wouldn't work in, in broadcast. To me, Arrested Development is the classic, you know, classic example of this. Right? If you, if you sort of fell into Arrested Development season three, episode five, you would have no idea what's going on. The show only makes sense if you can go back and, and get caught up. Stranger Things is another, you know, another, another example, right? It, it makes sense because you can, you can binge it. Um, so it's, it's not in a sense that Hollywood's lost their creative mojo. It's just that, again, the new, the new on-demand platforms allow you to do stuff that you just couldn't do in a traditional broadcast world. Um, but, but execution creativity is absolutely still important. There's, there's no doubt about that. Did that sort of answer your question? So it's a sort of question. Jump in on this? I'm just saying, just yeah. because you have data doesn't mean that yeah, you yeah. end up making you know better shows. I mean, at some level, the talent that is available to the Netflix in terms of creative is the same talent to an extent available to sometimes the large Hollywood studio. Except that maybe Netflix has this other advantages that is, it doesn't have to tell a linear story from nine to nine forty-five, take a break, then come back. Where else in the Netflix you could have you know, a 20 hours of show in mind versus a chunk of 45 minutes that also probably makes it more enriching maybe to the creator. Um, if you have, again, people who can make good stories, of course. I mean, you know, if, you, if you have a poor execution, it doesn't matter what you have. So as I said, right in baseball, if you have access to good data, it doesn't mean that you can make a better picture. The picture is still going to be the same picture. But if you have access to good data, maybe you can identify the talent and then nurture the talent and then kind of promote and support the talent, I think. Maybe, I mean, maybe another way to, to, to describe this is why, why did Netflix sign Adam Sandler to a five-movie deal? And why did Amazon sign Woody Allen to write a television show? Um, I think you could make an argument that both Adam Sandler and Woody Allen are niche tastes, acquired tastes. So why might they work for Netflix and Amazon? Because Netflix, and, and not for anybody in the traditional industry, because Netflix and Amazon know exactly who the Woody Allen fans are and exactly, I'll point at how, exactly who the you know, <laughs> Adam Sandler fans are. And they can promote that con to, content to them much more efficiently. And, and at least by all public announcements, Netflix is arguing that ad, its Adam Sandler creations have been a huge hit for the platform. So I guess what do you think about the sort of um, recommendation systems and like sort of the black hole sort of thing where I, I discover you like peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. I'm going to give you all these variants of peanut butter and jelly, blah, blah, blah. You don't like peanut butter and jelly anymore because I like inundated you with peanut butter and jelly. What do you think is the danger there with, with data-based so, storytelling? So I'll give one quick example. I was reading, uh, actually a reporter was asking me about it, so it came to my mind. So apparently Spotify runs, I, I'm not a sub Spotify subscriber, so I don't know all the detail, but Spotify has this, what, the Discover playlist or something? Yeah. yeah. So apparently this Discover playlist on Spotify is wildly popular. People love the Discover playlist. And I was actually reading a little about it, what it is. And it was nothing but you know, a recommendation system to figure out what songs people love. And this, to my, I guess, I shouldn't be surprised I'm from Carnegie Mellon, that recommendation systems is basically built on this deep machine learning, the, you know, the deep learning theory of machine learning. And I said, good. It offer you a bad recommendation? Of course it could offer you a bad recommendation. But it seems like our data analytics is getting more and more sophisticated and nuanced that more likely than not, it is actually going to delight users rather than disappoint users. You know, even without recommendation engine, human recommendations also have you know, significant amount of bad hit rate. So, right. At some level, you know, we are comparing the world before the engine versus the, after these engines came, up, came about. And I actually feel that, um, that most of the people are actually happy and will get more, they'll get even better uh, with time rather than, rather than relying on human curators who are probably as crappy as uh, we expect them to be. Well, and I, I, would, I would actually use, you know, and, and hopefully this won't be pandering to anybody in the audience, but, but the, my favorite example I use in class is just to take a screenshot of my YouTube front page. 
You know, you've got Rolling Stones clips, you've got baseball highlights, you've got West Wing episode clips. I mean, you guys do an amazingly good job of presenting me with 16 different clips that I can easily waste 45 minutes on just, just <laughs> exploring around. And I think being able to say, you know, here are a bunch of recommendations. It looks like Mike isn't clicking on the peanut butter and jelly ones as much as he once did. Let's, let's transition to something new. I think is actually pretty darn powerful. And I think, I think you guys actually do an amazingly good job at that. And thank you. He's discovered his Google profile. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Hi, Question from a former student. Yes, uh, I studied in both of them, so I like to <laughs> see, uh, you know, ask you questions. Uh, um, so it seems like there's some sort of a war going on, like a battle going on between the incumbent, you know, entertainment, you know, players versus the ones that are already established. Uh, where do you think? Uh, who do you think is going to win, or where do you think is the, you know, the the stabilization point between this? You know, you take I don't this know. one. Uh, I don't know if there's a war going on, but I would say that the, the traditional players are not used to an entry from yeah. basically yeah. A, tech, you know, a technology startup who used to be just a distributor. I mean, you know, it was a DVD distributor. That's what Netflix was, and then became a distributor for streaming. And now it, it realized that it can actually do a pretty good job of creating content and just make vertically integrated, you know, all in one shop. Now, who is going to win? You know, I have a, you know, the ground fact is that I think some of the things that we mentioned in the book, that is having access to audience, having this huge customer base, having ability to identify their interests, I think they are going to play an increasingly important role in, in giving you a competitive advantage. Could the traditional players? you know, to, to, to be able to acquire those, of course. I mean, you know, they have deep experience in building very good content, as you might. You know, they, they make those interesting stories. Uh, you know, they have access to some of their own platform. They can actually negotiate quite hard. I think one of the things that we didn't have enough time to talk about is that, you know, a lot of these online platforms actually share no data with them. Uh, some of it is because it never occurred to them that they should actually ask for that data. They don't have the right sort of skills. But I think there is a possibility that you know, maybe it will go in that direction where these companies will also say, I can also use some of these skills that, that these firms has and build some of that into, into my business model. So I don't know who is going to be the winner. Maybe there are going to be some mergers. Who knows? I mean, that, that's really harder to say. Maybe Mike uh, can look in the future better. No, I was gonna, I was gonna say, you know, something, something very similar. Go, going back to the perfect storm analogy, right? We all know how the book ends. Um, the, the, well, I won't spoil it for you. Um, <laughs> we're, I think, we're, we're not saying that's the preordained outcome for the for the traditional people in in the industry. In fact, in in Hollywood, it would be really cool if they had an independent digital distribution platform that received funding from the studios that that created. And hopefully by now you've picked up that I'm talking about Hulu. Gee. <laughs> um, you know, that, that I, I think they actually have some pretty interesting assets they can, they can bring to bear in this. So who, who wins? I don't, I don't know. But I think this is a very interesting battle. I don't, I don't think it's obvious one side wins and, and the other side loses. In the end, I think consumers win, right? Um, and that, that's, the dog, that's the dog slide at the end. Just a follow-up question: Have you have you heard back from any of the or, or your counterparts in the industry about what their reaction to the book is, and uh, do they feel threatened? Do they feel excited about the changes that are? Coming? Depends on depends on who you ask. <laughs> That's right. I will say we've presented this to three of the six studios, and we're presenting to two more tomorrow. Um, and and in fact, we've we've received really good feedback on on what we're saying in in the book. Um, I think they. I think they're much more receptive to this message than a lot of people outside the industry would suspect. I think the other thing that we've recognized working with the studios is that the studios are not monolithic in any, in any sense. right? If you ask five people in a studio what they think their digital strategy ought to be, you're going to get seven different answers. Um, you know, that, that, that there, there is a, a strong debate within the entertainment industry today internally about what should we be doing. And again, a big part of the reason we wanted to write this book is we wanted to give a different perspective on why this is something where you should move right now. 
You know, uh, when you get a speaker from Amazon and Google come and talk in the class, in the university, every time you hear is that every decision is done made from data. No matter how trivial the decision is, we are going to do an A-B testing, we are going to do this, we are going to do that. And then you move into this world where you know, a lot of these decisions are actually not based on you know, serious data. You know, it's based on this is how we did things, this is how things work. That culture, I think, probably will change. I think increasingly the firms, I think the traditional, they're already realizing you know, just hiring the right sort of talent, making sure that the data, it's a, it's a, lot, of, uh, it's a lot of cultural change. I'm pretty sure that that change will take place. Well, whether that's going to be enough or not is, is anybody's guess. So you could, you could phrase the, like the thing that Rahul was talking about earlier about the distribution being a really uh, inefficient thing that then we had technology that could overcome that, technology that could give a better product. Um, there's like a gap that existed there. There was a gap between what was possible and what was provided. Do you see this still a gap? Have we gotten as far as we can go or are there, are there like, um, rather than just, are we just tipping the balance further from here on in of the same kind of stuff? Or is, it, or is there something different to come? Is there, some, is there still a gap between what we can do now and what is happening? So in term, did you mean in terms of distribution? Can you, I mean, I, I wasn't clear. I was, I was generalizing from distribution in terms of anything that's possible now. So like, what, what te- is there still things that technology can do that the movie industry hasn't leveraged, that Netflix doesn't do? Netflix has to kind of go into a new way of dealing that doesn't do yet. I know the answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, you know, can I mean, you see a gap? Is, can you see anything I, that you're like, oh, I wish I would fix that? Or I, I feel like the technology, there's a one aspect with the, whether the technology makes a lot of things possible. What the challenge comes is what is the business model behind the right. technology that I can make money, right? I mean, technology makes it possible that I can make the, I can make the movie available on streaming platform on day one. You know, there is enough bandwidth available, there is enough storage available, all the devices, that's possible. But there is no business model that that will allow the firms to say, can I profitably do that so that that I can actually recover my investment back? I think, so the engineers will keep developing all of these, how to distribute better, how to distribute more efficiently, how to lower the cost of production, but then can we have the business model? That right, so that's kind of like more faster, and that'll keep happening. Is that the cheaper and faster? Cheaper, faster. I think that that for sure. But but as I said, you know, can what is the business okay. model on the top of it? I guess the interesting transformation is that we don't watch. You know, we don't watch the TV show on the first day it comes out anymore. You know, I started um, House of Cards probably four months after it was first released because I just didn't get around to it, and then I watched the whole thing. You know, yeah. That that's like a, a change, like a like a change in the style of, of consuming. Yeah. Is there, are there more style changes, or is it is it just more faster? And then, no, I think I think there are plenty of really interesting style changes just like that. You know that that the audience can watch it in different ways, and that enables the storytellers to tell different stories that wouldn't have worked. And there's this wonderful feedback loop of all sorts of really cool innovation. I think the other the other thing we're seeing is a shift from again when when channels are scarce. You've got to have a system that says, I'm going to choose what gets made before it gets made. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to have this choke point. It's, it's, not, it's not arbitrary. It's that I can only distribute a certain amount of stuff, so somebody's got to choose. One of the wonderful things about having an abundance in distribution is that you can let everything get made. And then on the back end, see what, what works. You know, my, my daughter loves watching videos of other people playing Minecraft on, on YouTube. It's not obvious that's a good idea, yeah. ex ante. Yeah. Um, but it, it, it clearly delivers a lot of value for her, and that's, and that's OK. As economists, we don't judge. <laughs> right. but <as> a parent. <laughs> fair, fair point. I just add to I think he said who is going to be the you know who is going to be the winner. I mean, if you look at Netflix, because of the technology, for them it's it's easier for them to be able to offer these shows where you can do binge watch on a television that's just much harder to do that. Um, now the Netflix of this world are also changing expectation from people about what is that they want in the content. Now you know you ask a 21 year old or 18 year old. I mean, for them, this idea that I'm going to watch an episode from 9 to 9:45 every Thursday, that just doesn't, I think, appeal to them. 
they want it when they want it at their convenience, maybe watch the whole thing. And now you can see that the Netflix platforms offers that opportunity. It gives them that feature that, again, a linear television probably doesn't give them a feature. So if they have to choose between the two, they say, well, then I would become a Netflix customer because Netflix gives me this tremendous flexibility that I can get it on my Comcast cable connection, for example, at least right now. So I think that's another element to, to, to this competition. Last question. Sure. I guess building on his thing is, um, well, actually, a number of years ago, my wife found this this film that was like audience participation, kind of choose your own adventure thing, where you, the audience voted where they wanted the next scene to go. So why aren't technology companies doing that type of thing with their platforms? They they seem to have the ability to do that. You're tapped into everybody's UIs. You can say, I want the next branch to go this way. I want the next branch to go that way. They call the games. What? They're called games. Yes. Yeah. Well, well, actually, I was I was going in a different direction. I was thinking epic rap battles of history. Have you have you seen this? That's well, you can you can vote like who won. You can but vote, necessary. right? Yeah. But do you, you don't really like at least from my experience, I I don't think you chain on to the next and follow that door. Do you? That's fair. That might yeah, that might be the next wasn't, thing. Wasn't I, I forget now? It skips me. Wasn't there an ABC show um, which actually had that people can send their stories in and that. Yeah, and I think I, I I forget it. I think it got it it actually got entangled into some sort of a copyright issue where this I think the Writers Association or something said you can't really have people who are not part of the Writers Association send the stories that become part of the net. So I'm I'm blanking on it, but I think I had in, this this weird angle to this whole user generated content going back into the show. There was this be, somewhat of a Bizarre friction, and then I think it, the whole show then eventually got canceled. I believe I forget. It was it was in the motherhood. It was this series of webisodes where where parents would write in their most embarrassing child stories, and then and then they would create a web yeah, they would create a webisode around this. And I forgot who bought it. I think it was ABC. Yeah, something like that. Bought the rights, and then as soon as people started sending in their ideas, the Writers Guild came in and said, you know, that's fine, but you've got to pay each idea that comes in a thousand dollars because that's the minimum. That's the guild minimum for for writing. So, so again, all that to say, there's a lot of existing structures that get in the way of of innovation, but there's also a whole lot of value you could create by doing some of these innovations. Okay. Thank you.